I think that's fine. It's three there, minutes. Three I'll minutes after Randy. five in Vermont by my watch. Uh, we've got Santa Claus with us tonight. That's very nice. Now he's frozen. Is she frozen? Yeah, she's frozen. She does Where's not have. Your... Here comes Randy. I you guys are all frozen too. There you are. Um, I might have to call in so that I can hear. Here comes the budget committee. Okay, here they come. Sarah, did you hear me? I think I might call in on okay. the phone. So you'll see me both. I'll be on the, but I want to, I don't want to lose it because I can't hear you guys very well. Okay. Okay. Well, wait a minute for you. Go ahead. No, I'm, I, I'm fine. You can start. I just am going to dial in as well. Actually, I don't have the dial in information. I'll, I'll look at it someplace else. Let's see. All I have is the link. It's a 301. Hold on. Yeah. 715. Yeah. 8592. Enter your meeting ID followed by pound. Welcome, Budget Committee. Please re enter your meeting ID followed by pound. This isn't the auto number. Uh, I'll look at it on the agenda. Oh God, what Evening. happened? Evening, Peter. We can hear you, Liz. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to go on mute and hope that I have better. All right. <clears throat> okay. So welcome everybody. Uh, we have the budget committee with us. Uh, and who else? Paul Otenti. Oh, Paul. Where's Paul? I don't He's see him. down there. Uh, He's oh, there on he my is. list. Yeah. Now we, yeah, he just he just popped in. Hi, Paul. Thank you. Welcome. Um, so uh the first uh thing on tonight's agenda is the uh progress on the budget. And uh full disclosure, I do not have Dorinda's latest printout i have the one from the last meeting so i'm going to try and follow along with the changes she's come up with and see where we are so yes Peter, we have to amend the agenda you you wanted to talk about something with vic and we also have to ask add the trails committee discussion that mike levine did you get his email today yes i did okay. yes okay so if you would add that to the agenda and we can we can do the uh uh conversation with victor under the highway report that's fine Okay, so we're all good to go? Yep. Okay, so Dorinda, you're on. Um, there was very minor changes that came in. Um, I think I got something like Vermont League dues. And um, so I really didn't change a lot. I did find an addition error in my um, in all my calculations, so that got adjusted, but we're still sitting kind of where we left the other day at um, 10 point, uh, where are we? 10.89%. 10, 10 and that's with a 5% um, increase in the wages. Yeah. Yep. So I was hoping I would have some kind of uh, divine intervention of thought about this after our last meeting. And I really, uh, I really don't have much, much more to say than, than I've already said. I mean, it would be, it would be very sweet if we could uh, get the increase down below 10%, but I think for all the reasons we discussed the last time, it it is what it is where it is. Um, but I'm interested in hearing what other people think. You've got your hand raised, Steve. You're on mute. You. Still no, on mute. 
There you go. There we go. Sorry about that. So on the special articles, um, you've got like a, a decrease of $31,000. Are those items going to be coming in anyway, right? Yeah. And from yes. what I understand, the library is um, going to be higher than last year. Um, that's what the rumor is. And, but anything that's not accounted for has not come in yet. Okay. A little, right. uh, and I'm, and I'm being very honest when I can't remember who told me this, but it was probably through my darling spouse who's still connected to the library. She said they had changed their mind and decided, uh, they were firmly told that they would have to get a petition if they wanted to increase their amount. Uh, so I believe we're going to see uh, a letter request from the library just for the same amount. But until we get it, we won't know. Okay. But truly, as we always as we always discuss, as we might grumble and chomp at the bit about the special articles, we have no real control over those anyway. Right. So what we're focusing on is the budget without the special articles. And I know uh, budget committee, you were just you were just having a meeting. Uh, where are you? Where are you on this? I don't believe the the budget committee hasn't uh, taken a vote as a whole for a group. So at this point in time, um, I don't believe we're we're set to to provide a, a recommendation as a group. Um, I can speak as an individual. Um, I, I personally feel that uh, offering a 5% uh, COLA on top of the broad sweeping market adjustment that was provided earlier um, is, is pretty tough to swallow. Um, if the market adjustment hadn't happened, I would be more than happy to see a number like that. It's, it's just not the right time in my personal opinion. Um, okay. I hear you. I, I, I hear you and I understand. Um, other members of the budget committee, you're, I mean, we're not, I, I just want to be clear. We're not finalizing the budget tonight. Um, this is just another opportunity to look at it and make, uh, make changes if we think we need to make changes. But uh, certainly I'm hoping we're going to ultimately, whatever we come up with, we're going to have the support of the budget committee. That's what we have you guys here to do, yes. So, Peter, um, historically, have we ever had a budget increase of this size before the voters? In my memory, no. Dorinda, do you ever remember having an increase like this? I can't. No, I don't think so. <clears throat> I think, I think, and I was trying to think about this, and I looked back through some of my stuff, and I really couldn't find anything. I mean, I'm sure we've got the information, but I think one year we did do a five or 5.5% 5 .5 increase, but that's the highest one that I remember. And I can't even remember when that was. And the other, you know, the other variable, the other unknown is just how much of this will be absorbed by the grand list, correct? Yes. This, so again, it's, and this is not, and there's no, I don't, I don't want to lead everybody to believe that I think the grand list is going to soak up a big portion right. of it, but certainly there's a chance it's going to soak up a significant amount of it. So believe me, I'm hoping this is not a 10.89% tax increase. And the other, the other right. thing we have, the other thing we have is uh, we have a significant fund balance And this. If there was ever a year to maybe use a little of this fund balance, that might be, this might be the year too. So that's, that's the other thing we have working for us. Yes, Randy. Uh, so I have a, a question and then a comment based on that. Um, so the question that I have is for Dorinda, does this um, latest budget worksheet, does this include change in health care costs um, based on the discussions that have been had? Yes. And where does where does that stand as of now from a from a select board's uh, point of view? Is, are those conversations continuing on or is that something that you guys have voted on you'll have to excuse me i haven't i haven't really uh i i don't remember if you voted on uh increasing the compensation for health care to include spouses and and the such we have not voted on it randy because it's it's 
It's in these numbers. It's in the budget proposal, but we have not voted on it. So there has been right now, there's no official policy change right now. Um, let me clarify. Yeah. I think in one of these uh, changes, I'm looking at under the health insurance and I don't see where I did. I think I put it in and then took it out because it wasn't. Um, I. I don't think that um, change in healthcare has been made according to these numbers. Okay. I'm going to um, have to go back and relook, visit this one. So let me, let me revise my statement. We've discussed it. It is now not yet in these numbers, but it's certainly out there for further discussion. Okay. Um, it, hasn't been, then, it hasn't been finalized. Now we have, the, the, the tricky part of, of that one is that we have done it for uh, two of our employees. So we're in the world of, you know, not following our personnel policy at the moment. So we're going to have a real problem if we say we're going to back away from what we already committed to. So the real question is, do we now make that our policy that that's what we do? without really knowing, as I think you pointed out before, Randy, or somebody did, we can't be sure who's going who's gonna to take this coverage and who isn't. And the other thing we can't be sure of is, and we haven't decided is, uh, what, we would, what we would offer to people who choose not to take this. So- um, It's still in the air. Okay. So my understanding was that um, when this was offered to secure the bookkeeper slash assistant, um, it wasn't a, offered as a guarantee that next year they were going to get that. It was going to be explored. That was my understanding, and I hope I'm not wrong in understand that understanding. Um, but uh, it seems to me that um, going through the exploration process is meets the statement that was made. And correct me if I'm wrong. The other thing, you know, that I, I was looking at is you made a comment about trying to get down below the, you know, the double digit increase and yeah. without even talking about the healthcare piece of it, just to get down to 10%, you know, a two and a half percent COLA gets you down to that 10%. So, you know, I guess that's just a statement. I don't need a follow up on that, but thought I'd throw it out there. Oh no, I I understand. I understand. Um, yeah, I I am I am as I think I said before. I am I am really between the devil and the deep blue sea on this one. Having just been through this thing with the road crew and um, hiring our accounting person and uh, everything else we've been going through, I am just very nervous about you know backsliding again i mean we've done this so many times in the past where we've said well our our goal is a four percent increase and if we make the cola this it makes the four percent and and guess what doing that year after year we got ourselves behind so i don't know yes so it, it sounds like it's safe but so let's assume for the moment that by some measure we could get the budget increase down to 10 percent let's just assume that for a moment i don't know how we do it but let's just assume it um can that can a budget increase of 10 percent be sold to the voters that's that's a that's a big question we have never what i would tell you is in all the years, we've never had the voters turn down a budget, but it certainly could happen. And, you know, it, it's especially a little chancy when we still don't know uh, whether we're even going to be able to have a town meeting. So we're going to be able to explain this in person. We'll certainly be able to explain it in some kind of Zoom meeting or pre-town meeting or who, know, who knows what it's going to be. But chances are whatever the budget is, it's not gonna be able to be amended from the floor like it would be if we mm -hmm. had a traditional town meeting. So- But, but it's, uh, safe, it's safe to assume, Peter, that with a 10% budget, 
just probability wise, there's going to be an increase to the tax rate. Correct. Yes. And so, you know, that's, we have to think about that in terms of this continued high rate of inflation that may persist through most or all of next year, depending on when the supply chain problem finally figures itself out. So, you know, you've got people who are concerned about inflation and their groceries and their gas costing more, and now they're going to pay more in property taxes. So that's yeah. going to be a tough sell. Well, you know, it's interesting because the way I think about the way I think about inflation, which may be right or may be wrong, is what's the point if you get a six or ten or whatever percent it is pay increase, and yet the cost of everything you pay for goes up the same amount, which is sort I mean it doesn't track exactly and it certainly doesn't happen at the same time, but over time, that's exactly what happens because all the prices go up. Somehow you got to pay for those pay increases, and somehow you got to pay for the increased cost of goods, and they're paying their employees' pay increases. So it's a it's a spiraling uh, mm -hmm. spiraling effect. I just want to be sure. I just want to be sure that we are paying competitive wages to our people, and you know whether that number means we need a COLA of, of two and a half percent or five percent or nine percent or who knows what you know it, it, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a crapshoot but I've been reading a lot about inflation and now the now the feds are going to start ratcheting up the interest rates that isn't going to help inflation um you know, I don't think it's I don't think it's going down anytime soon is what I'm is what I'm saying. And I just want to make sure we don't get behind. So I have to believe and, and I'm an optimist, but I have to believe properly explained to the voters. And hopefully, hopefully we can at least have some kind of maybe have some kind of an in, indication. So by town meeting, we can say, you know, we believe that with a combination of the increase in the grand list, whatever that is, and and potentially putting in some of the fund balance, we can keep the increase um, below that magic ten percent mark. And I don't know, you know, politically, is it does it feel better to say nine point eight percent than ten point eight percent? I think maybe it does. But mm -hmm. you know, in the past when we've tried to do that and we've said, oh, you know, no matter what, we don't want to go over four percent or whatever the number was. To be truthful, people don't seem to pay a lot of attention, and probably because it's been because we've been so conservative. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other thing, the other thing, the, the third piece of this of this stool that we need to think about, and this doesn't happen until we set the tax rate. But when we actually set the tax rate, inevitably, and do the budget and set the tax rate to support that budget, we end up underspending the budget nine times out of 10, and by a significant amount, I mean, 20 or $30,000. So potentially, could we be a little more conservative in the way we set our tax rate? Yes, we could. Yes, we could. Um, we have flexibility on that. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to put us in a position where we don't collect enough taxes to cover the budget. But, you know, could we knock, could we knock 10,000 off? Probably we could. So those are the those are the mm -hmm. tools other than changing the numbers in the budget. Those are the tools we have. Steve. Yes. Hand up. Steve. Yeah. Yeah, Peter, <clears throat> I just wanted to uh, uh, reiterate what you were talking about. You know, like we've kind of dug ourselves out of this hole as far as the pay across the board, which I think is a good thing. And it, and it is like Randy's saying, it's pretty hard to swallow. But I do think that we need to keep with that 5%. But I was doing some uh, things here before, and, and I was just, just a suggestion. I was saying that we could reduce uh, that by $25,000 out of our fund balance, which brings it down to 9.01%. Um, and that's that's a suggestion to bring it down under that 10 percent if we wanted to if that was a, a target you were trying to get under 
Right. Doesn't our fund balance allow us to avoid, you know, and I don't know what's in there. I, 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 we talked about it a little while ago, but I can't remember what the numbers were. But um, Randy, Randy, yeah. the, un the un unallocated fund balance per Dorinda is about 188,000. Okay. So I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, potential issues with, you know, uh, say we run into issues with delinquent taxes or something like that, and we're still making, you know, education payments and all that kind of stuff. I mean, isn't that what we traditionally lean on that fund balance for? And do we put ourselves into uh, a position where we potentially struggle to, um, you know, to do, to do both of those things? And then the other, the other comment I have about dipping into the fund balance to offset this is it's kind of a band-aid for this year. You get you get hit with it twice the following year when you when you're making up for the difference in what you what you bought down by the fund balance and then any increases in the in the following year as well. So I'm a little bit worried about that. Well, so the fund balance, and I'll recognize you in a minute, Dorinda. I see your hand. The fund balance gives us a cushion in a lot of ways, Randy. I mean, there have been years where we have had bills and we've had to borrow against taxes because the money hasn't come in fast enough. There have been years when we've had uh, delinquent taxes and I can't ever remember Dorinda if we borrowed again. I don't think we've ever had to borrow for delinquent taxes, but we've had to borrow, borrow against future taxes to, uh, to cover cash flow. So it gives us a cushion on cash flow. Um, but the purpose of the fund balance I think part of the purchase of the fund balance is to try and keep the increases as even as we can over time. So when we have an exceptional increase, to me, that's a good time to use a little bit of the fund balance, not a lot. But I mean, as Steve said, if we use 25,000, which is a sm pretty small percentage of the fund balance, that makes a big, you know, that would that would get us down in the, in the neighborhood at least of 9% without any increase in the grand list. The problem with all this stuff is, guys, that we don't know those numbers. I mean, we're sitting here right now and we don't know those numbers. If we knew, if we knew we were gonna have a six percent increase in our in our grand list, wow, I I love it when I, I said this, I think at the last meeting, when you read in the paper almost every night, some town is saying this budget or that budget is gonna affect the tax rate this much. They don't know that. I mean, they're making some kind of projection about what their grand list is gonna do, which is a real shot in the dark. So I am I am very hesitant to say, you know, that we're going to get a lot from the grand list. But, you know, from what I've heard about sales over the last over the last two years, the sales are high, higher than asking and higher than appraised value significantly. So that would that would tell us that uh, potentially the grand list should be should be going up. But obviously, it doesn't track necessarily in a timely manner. Yes, Dorinda. Um, I have several comments in looking at this health insurance thing. I know the reason that it never got plugged in, because I believe at the last point we were debating how we were going to handle the HSA contribution, if it was going to be doubled or currently we give the employee so much and then we only give $500 towards the spouse. If we equal it to what the um, employee is getting, which I just plugged the numbers in, that now has us up to a 12.10% increase. So that is your new number with adjusting the health insurance. If you go exactly employee, spouse, and same HSA contribution and all of that. Yeah. Um, secondly, back to the fund balance. I have never supported using fund balance to reduce the taxes. And for several of the reasons that we've mentioned, we have borrowed, but we borrow from ourselves. is we go into our bridge fund, we go into our paving fund and we have borrowed. The only reason we were able to offer four payments to the taxpayers was because we can float our money this way. Um, you are much better off reducing your debt than you are um, offsetting your tax rate. 
you know, like there's a lot of expenses scheduled for the upcoming year. Every day, more come in and the money is better spent. The other reason why we have $186,000 in that fund balance was last year we got extra payments for COVID and we also were able to collect $72,000 the last week of June. That was from um, two years ago that had not been submitted. Mm -hmm. And so that has helped. And that's the only reason we're at $186,000 in that fund balance. Yep. Yes, Liz. Dorinda, can I, I'm just looking at this um, spreadsheet and could you just, so I have two questions. Um, could you just tell me what you did with the health insurance tab to change that to 12%? What were you doing? I went over to the health insurance tab and I made the family spouse equal to what the employee's portion is. That is for the, um, okay. the premiums each month. And then under HSA contract, Contribution, I doubled the 1850. Okay. For the ones who were um, not, who were just 1850? No, for the one, doubled the two person people. Okay. Because the two person people, HSA, it says 2350 on this spreadsheet. Right. Because they get 1850 and 500 for their spouse. But if you're going to match oh. what the spouse is, okay. it's going to be 1850. Plus. 1850 plus 1850. Okay. Yep. Now, um, I have a question. You know, in terms of, you know, possible ways to get it below 10,000 that might, um, be reasonable for this next year and maybe using fund balance money instead because it's one time purchase would be um, the tennis court has the $10,000 tennis court repair, um, which, you know, isn't a recurring um, expense year after year. So if we took that out of the budget and decided to do it, and maybe used fund balance money for that, then you don't have to worry about replacing that fund balance money for next year. We also have, you know, this, which I, I agree we should have this, but maybe this is not the year to start it, which is the unforeseen road repair, $5,000. And again, if we have an unforeseen road repair and it's not budgeted, then we use it from the fund balance. So that's like 15,000 right there that brings it before the health insurance thing to under 10% between those two things. And then maybe, you know, I think Randy does have a point about the salaries is that we just did a very generous salary increase and maybe, you know, we reduce that 5% to 3%. And if it, you know, appears to be the kind of year that we feel, you know, maybe we need to be giving out a bonus or something, that can come from the fund balance. Um, I think a 5% expectation is, um, I mean, that's, I don't know of anyone who's giving out 5% necessarily as their across the board um, increase. Um, I agree that people are, you know, competitive, um, but I also believe that we just did a very good thing and I have brought people up to a reasonable amount um and a healthy amount so you know i think there's opportunities to get this below ten thousand um by doing some small things that if we need to we could maybe pull from the fund budget i mean from the, um, you the screen peter peter where yes. you go? Uh, i just want to read a i'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. partner can't these uh, numbers I can talk now, Sarah, if you... Okay, great. Um, can you go ahead, Lise, I'm sorry. sorry. I made a comment a while back in talking. I was just saying that um, in terms... You asked about support of the you know, the budget stuff. And what I was saying is just that um, while 10 percent's a lot, I don't see how to avoid it. And I think that the wage increases, um, 
at a minimum have to be COLA and then there should be some consideration of merit on top of that. But also I think you've done you know, a significant raise already this year. So you'll consider the whole package. Sorry, that's an odd timing. Yeah. So, so it looks to get the budget increase under 10%. It looks like we need to slice about 30,000 from the budget and Liz just offered up 15,000, which mean, means we need to find another 15,000 to get us from the 12.1 to a, to a hair under 10. I mean, are there other places we could be more conservative and take a chance this year and assume that we're gonna underspend in areas that maybe historically have we have underspent in the past? That's a tough one. Because <laughs> it isn't always the same. It yeah, is no. Place. Jumps I mean, so around. Here's, I know. Here's what we here's what we always say, and and uh, and Victor's going to shiver, and Steve is going to shiver, and I'm going to shiver. But the truth of the matter is, all the money's in the roads and the road equipment. So you know, if you want to yeah. if you want to find some money, there's yeah. there's where it's, the money is. Unfortunately, yeah. So we have the budget. Worked so. hard, again, we've worked hard to uh, ratchet up our our money on the roads, whether it's whether it's buying gravel or you know, whatever. And uh, I hate to think about doing that, but I mean, we can certainly find, find in a combination of different categories, $10,000 in the road budget, if that's what we want to do. Yes, Victor. Yeah, we, um, you know, in that you're, you're correct that we did uh, increase that gravel uh, because we felt that it was very important to do, to uh, resurface some of these roads. Uh, you know, I guess you either, uh, don't pay as much in taxes or you ride on rough roads. <laughs> and the other thing is uh, nobody's saying right here. And, you know, these, I, I hate to even say this, but uh, you know, what Randy started out with, with that 5% uh, COLA and, and that's very generous. I, I would not want to take that away from any of our employees, but I mean, I was thinking about it and isn't what, we increased their salaries was about 12%. I mean, should that be taken into consideration or no? I mean, I, of course, Victor, of course, of course it should. The, the, the question is, you know, the way I look, the way I look at that adjustment is that's something we should have done before. Now we did it now and, and hallelujah. And we can, we believe we can absorb that in, in this year's budget and carry it forward. That's fine. That's fine. But do we have to increase it uh, to, the, to the extent that uh, you set the 5%? In other words, uh, um, you know, uh, 5% on top of it is, is, is quite a bit, really. And uh, we, I've noticed that we get those, and maybe you do too, you, you get those uh, people advertising the jobs uh, for town yeah. like we did. And hey, a lot of those are down around 22 bucks an hour. Yeah, they're down. not hiring people either. <laughs> well, that's not necessarily, you don't know that, and it's not necessarily true. I mean, well, there's, well, all I would say, no, I, you know, depending on qualifications or whatever, Right. Who knows? I mean, we found we certainly couldn't hire somebody good. You couldn't do it, you know. But you know, you're right. We didn't. We did. We had a hard time doing it. Right. Right. I mean, you know, you hear. I mean, I've been trying to. I've been trying to to reach out to various employers around and see what they were doing for cost of living increases. And a lot of them are telling me that they're going through the same kind of struggles that we're going through. I didn't get any. Uh, well, I'm sure they are. Yeah. Yes, Mark. So, so every every percent on the coal way is what like forty eight hundred bucks. So, I mean, if we if we look at what Liz has suggested, she's got fifteen thousand, and we shave or point it two off coal, you're still got you've still got probably five thousand that you five or six thousand that you've got to find. Could take that out of the road budget. I mean, it could take a little bit out of a couple of different places and get this down under 10%. Not pretty, but you know, spread the spread the risk around. Right. 
So let me ask, let me ask you this. This is another idea which would potentially save a little money. If we said, if we said that the spousal health insurance was going to be that we would pay 100% of the premium instead of 50%, but that the HSA, con yeah. HSA contribution was half. So instead of 1850, it was 900 or maybe even 500 yeah. for, for this year. I mean, paying the other half of the premium is a big, uh, yeah. is a big deal. I mean, so yeah. maybe we mm -hmm. do all that in one year. Well, I think you could even get the HSA premium down to like 1200 or something like that. Um, I did the same thing. I've been plugging in these numbers and switching stuff around. So if you keep the spousal at full paying for the spouse um, and you take out that 15000 and there was one other small thing I took out for 2000 Oh, no, if you took out the future grant mix, it's 10.1% increase. <laughs> if you took out the $2,000 grant match, you know, and used, use your discretionary mon money for it. I mean, yep. I think that there's a way to get this under 10%. I mean, the, the, other, the other thing, thing to do would be just, you know, one one thing we we haven't spent in recent years consistently to get to get to I think it was Mark question um, is we almost never spend all our discretionary money. So maybe instead of putting what we've been putting in the discretionary, we just put two thousand less in the discretionary. Dorinda shaking yeah. her head. Oh, no. we, we we just don't account for it in the discretionary line. It, when something comes through that's unbudgeted, we say, take it out of discretionary. And it, there's never been a journal entry made that moves because when it happens at the time, it goes to whatever that expense is. So if you used it to put windows into the town hall, it went to town hall repairs. And the money, so it just, increase that category that right. ten thousand dollars or whatever it's been sitting there just offsets the bottom line basically just bottom no, line it the, it helps the bottom line but typically we don't go we, we don't necessarily go over budget in those categories where that money goes either town hall repair being a good example so, sometimes we do sometimes we don't um right. One of my things is the paving fund. Um, so we have a paving project that's definitely split, slated for the spring. I think um, we have a grant for part of it, but I believe we only have 200 and some thousand dollars in that one. I don't have that number right here with me now. So how far over are we going to have to pick up the difference there because that will have to come out of the fund balance. This M11. And, and for, I thought, and correct me if I'm I'm wrong, Victor, but weren't we? And maybe it was maybe it was a uh, pie in the sky estimating. But when we made the decision not to do the culverts in the fall and do the temporary paving and all that, weren't we thinking we would have enough money in our uh, yes. in our paving to cover that project? Thanks. So. Absolutely. Yeah, you got it's what, what the 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 bill to Hutchins was what three hundred and thirty something thousand dollars, and uh, we'll, you'll get a hundred and seventy five thousand dollar grant. But then uh, we're we're planning, I guess, we're planning to uh, remove the pavement ourselves. So uh, that'll be less money that we'll have to spend. We're hoping. Well, the other place is you've got thirty thousand dollars going into that fund on this year. So, because the paving project is being done, do we reduce that line item? Because if that is covered, you know, we could skip a year and then start back up. Because yeah. we certainly won't be doing a paving project the following year, or probably a few years down the road. Well, they don't. They don't give them. They don't give us grants uh, every year. That's for sure. But we'll, right. So that's why I'm saying. So right. why put another thirty thousand dollars into that fund if 
if that is, um, you know, if we if we don't need it for the paving project. Yes, yeah, Sarah. I just want to clarify, uh, Liz, can you clarify the $15,000? Is that from the tennis court or is that from the highway department? But the, where's this? 15? It was two pieces, 10,000 from the tennis court and 5,000 for emergency road repairs. <laughs> Okay. Or, or yeah, yeah, like, like non-budgeted or something like that. Really okay. Really and the other thing I just wanted you to know that I just got an email from the Kellogg Hubbard Library. They do have their petition together and it is going to be 32022. How much is that increasing then? Well, let's see. 1%. It's, my, it's an increase of $2,000 plus, right? Yeah. Could you repeat so that they got, again, they Sarah? They got the signatures or they're trying to get the signatures? 022. She said 32 the 022? Um, yeah. 32022. Sarah, so did he say they had the signatures or they were trying to get the signatures? He says that they all, almost have them all. It's but a 7.45% increase. Yeah. Well, again, special articles marked, yes. <laughs> so, so based on... <laughs> Dorinda's comment about the annual contribution to the paving fund. If we were to forego that for 22-23 and simply reduce the budget by that amount and get us to under 10%, what risk does that pose in the short term in terms of our, our paving expenditures or you know, our paving fund? Is there any risk to doing that? The answer is there's risk to everything mm -hmm. but if if we you know it's 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 the old thing yes we can stop putting money in the paving fund we can stop putting money in the bridge fund we can stop contributing to the uh environmental stuff i mean we can we can whack 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 but in the end it's going to hurt us because when we need that money we're not going to have it which is yeah. what i'm more about well, but I'm, but I'm, I'm no problem but taking maybe ten thousand dollars out of the paving fund. I would hate yeah. to, I would hate okay. to forego it all. But to say, all right, we'll reduce it by ten thousand yeah. dollars for a year. Right. So if we go with deal. the, yeah, if we go with the fifteen thousand that Liz has found, and we take ten thousand out of the paving fund, we're very close to getting under ten percent. Well, and then you, you know, if every one percent on that cola is 4,800 4, bucks. We're, we're almost there. You know. Well, didn't she also suggest that we do two and a half percent rather than five? I, or, I did, yes. Oh, you did? And, and it wasn't um, it wasn't um, a recommendation from um, Liz? Uh, uh, no, I, I did recommend that we lower it from five it's to from either two and a half or three. You said three. Yes. Um, three percent doing the three percent gets us to ninety six hundred dollars. Um, Ten point oh seven percent, um, but I haven't changed with the ten grand from the paving fund. I took out. I know I didn't take out ten grand from the paving fund. But if we did all four things, we'd be under ten percent. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't taken out. I didn't even take out the two thousand for the grant either. So the only things I took out were. 5,000 for that road, um, extra road repair, whatever that was called, um, road, unforeseen road. road repairs I took out, and then the tennis court at 10,000, and then reduced it to 3%. But I also, for the health insurance, I turned the HSA contribution to 1,200. So if we did that less, if you turn the HSA contribution to 1,000, a thousand for the spouse, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That what is be, the okay, if so you're doing a thousand for the spouse, then that would be twenty eight fifty. That'd be twenty eight fifty. So nope. Now, now I'm up higher. Okay. So, um, but you guys, you're all over the place here. First of all, <laughs> I, I think it's a mistake to take money out of the tennis court when you just started that fund last year. Ten point seven eight. You. you should I'm not you know, suggesting that we take it out. No, no, but I'm just saying that, you know, possibly, it, it, you know, it's, um, I think we have to look at where we are with these fund these funds that we have put aside. And unfortunately, I don't have a copy of that home with me. 
Um, um, so I, I can't don't... tell you. What Look, I just whoa, whoa, whoa! Stop! Can we just stop for one quick second? Yeah. I. I am worried about the damn tennis court and whether right. what we call it a, I don't know what we call it. We call it different things other than the tennis court, but we're going to make the same mistake that the city of Montpelier made if we're not careful. They didn't maintain their tennis courts and then they spent, I think it was like a quarter of a million dollars rehabbing their tennis courts because they let them go. So they were virtually unplayable. Our, our court is on the brink of being virtually I'm not suggesting Unplayed. that you oh. don't give ten thousand. I'm saying you take ten thousand from your um, dis not discretionary, but the um, the what it, I I can never remember the name of it. The one hundred eighty thousand dollar fund, but that you don't put it in the budget this year. Fund balance. The fund, fund balance, balance. That, you, that you can you can take it from the fund balance if you want, but it doesn't show up. Of course, that's not very transparent to the voters. Here's um, here's the other thing. Here's the other thing that that I've been, I've been thinking about just on this, on this COLA thing, because I'm very concerned if we cut that too much. I'd rather put $4,800, take $4,800 out of the highway budget somewhere else and add 1% to the COLA, make it, make it 4% instead of 3%. I mean, historically, we've done 2 or 3%, and that's what got us in trouble. And maybe we're being too aggressive with the five in light of the rate raises, but I think three is too low. So I'd like to see, I'd like to see it before. And I think we can take 40, we can take 4,800 out of summer maintenance or winter maintenance or whatever, like nothing. I mean, I'm not saying it's nothing, but it's relatively small. And I think it's important to put it into wages, but I, I support, I support reducing the, uh, the contribution to the, uh, paving fund this year by ten thousand dollars. I support um, making the spousal HSA contribution either nine hundred or a thousand dollars for two or three hundred dollars. It doesn't make much difference. Um, the tennis courts, if we have to reduce that a little bit, I'm okay with that, but I don't want to do away with it. And I think with a combination of all the things we've been talking about, working it that way, we can get it below ten percent. Could someone refresh my memory on the gravel? Why that's so much more expensive this year than last? Because we need, we desperately need gravel. Okay. <laughs> We're going to buy more gravel. Okay. With that said, Peter, how about how about Wait, if we? Steve Martin had his hand up. Wait a minute, guys. I'm trying to recognize everybody as fast as I can, but if you all talk at once, we get nowhere. So hold on a minute, Randy. Durendi, you had your hand up. I think Steve had his up before me. Right. Okay, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I was going to uh, reiterate, like, I, I think that that 5% should be in there. Um, I guess I'd go along with the 4%, but I was going to ask Victor about taking some money out of the roadside mowing. What he thought of that? That's what I was going to say. That's exactly what I was going to say. Because instead of mowing it twice, let's mow it once like we did this year, and you really didn't notice the difference. I did, but okay. Well, that the only thing we didn't notice the save difference is that damn, that damn mower did such a crappy job. We might as well have only done it once. Might as well not have done it at all. Yeah, but that would save us 7000 correct? Okay. That's right. Sounds good. Dorinda. Um, I just want to say, as of the end of November, this is the budget status report through November, um, the highway department was at 45.41% of their budget. That's five months into the budget. We also will have, pr probably will have to use some of our fund balance to offset the increase in wages for the seven months. So we can't lose sight of that. Yeah, Randy. So I hear the strong support for the additional COLA moving up from the three to the 4% or the 5% that you guys, you guys have. So in my head, I'm wondering about compromising on, on, you know, that 4% and, you know, if you're looking at the health, the healthcare, picking up the premiums for the 
um, for the spouses and leaving the HSA contributions alone where they sit today, that'll make up some difference. It'll give, it'll give more COLA to the employees. Um, you're helping them out with the, with the healthcare premiums. You're just not investing as much into the, into the, um, HSAs. It's a compromise on both ends. It seems reasonable. Yes, Sarah. I'm not a board member, but I am an employee. And I think what Randy is proposing is more than more than reasonable. Okay. I would just leave the HSA contributions as they are now. But, you know, the road crew may kill me for that. What, what are they right yeah, now, Sarah? Failure. I mean, the spouse is paid half of whatever the employee is paid, right? No. Nope. Nope. Five, she's gonna, five, she's gonna, they, they get, get $500. $500. Five, Whatever. Plus eighteen fifty. Eighteen fifty for the employee. Right. Eighteen fifty right. for the employee plus five hundred. Okay. And that seems to me, if you guys are picking up the premiums for the spouses, that seems really, really generous to me. But maybe I'm, yeah. I, I'm not speaking for all the employees. I'm just speaking as an employee yeah. of one who benefits from this. That makes it twenty three fifty. Steve. Yeah, I was just wondering what I mean. All of these things. Can we have? one person just kind of itemize all of these different changes. Dorinda, do you have all of that? I have lost it part way through. <laughs> we put them in, took them out so many times that um, I got the health insurance back to where it's supposed to be. Um, so is, we go through the budget items that we're changing, then I guess, you know, I can update it from this end. Okay, so you're saying the health insurance is paying for the spouse the premiums insurance. for the, the spouse. premium but leaving the hsa the same yes can Guys, someone tell to, me if the new hire has a spouse? we need to wrap this up in about five minutes we're way over our time here mm -hmm. and i have salaries at a four percent increase correct yeah correct okay yep. all right so i just need to know the line items that you're changing okay so we're going to take we're going to take ten thousand dollars out of the contribution to the paving fund. The yeah, the paving fund. Okay. We're going to cut the contribution to the tennis court from ten to five. And what okay. else did we have, Liz? Um, we took out five thousand for um, unforeseen road repairs. Yep. Okay. Um, so you're leaving that at zero? Yeah, zero for unforeseen road repairs. And what happens if we have a spring storm? We'll pay for it out of the <laughs> fund balance. No, right. we're taking, I mean, we'll do with what we've historically done. We, yeah. we cover it with the but, amount that we have in, in winter or summer. Right now, but okay, but the storm is. Well, no, Where's that's, a, that's a new line item that they created a few years ago. So it wouldn't come, we could separate storm repairs, but that's fine. Okay. Yep. Yes, Sarah. When you're saying taking 10, cutting the contribution to the paving fund by 10,000, 10, what you really mean is contribute 20,000 to the paving fund, yes. right? Yes. That's correct. I still have us down to 10.73% with all that. Well, let Dorinda finish it. What line item was the paving fund on? I can't even find it. Oh, I got it. Okay, so that's 20,000. And the recreation was? Line 233. Yeah, 5,000 you want it? You said yeah. it out completely. 5,000 is what Peter just said. Okay. For the tennis courts. Yep. Okay. And you took so, out the roadside mowing? No, I didn't take roadside out roadside mowing. mowing. One line one twenty two. Okay. Oh, that'll get us right there. To seven thousand? To seven thousand instead of fourteen. It's gonna be the ooh, close for me, but not quite. 
I have 10.22. Mm. I might be doing the health insurance. I have eight, 10.88. I have 10.22. What do you have for the HSA? I have 23.50 for a two person and 18.50 for a single. Right. Oh, okay. You've got that right. I'm also counting the new hire as a two person. Is he or no. not? No, he's a single person. Oh, perfect. So that saves money. How much? Only, is only three people should be two people, two person. So paying for the premium for the spouse for health insurance, what's the cost of that? 7,600. I have us now down to nine and a half percent. <laughs> well, then you've got something out of yours that I didn't yeah. get out of mine. Is there grant money, Liz, that you've eliminated? No, I kept the grant money in. 255 I kept in, but, you know... And I made well, look, here's, salaries here's what I would suggest, guys. We need to. This has been a good discussion tonight. I I appreciate everybody's input. Um, if Dorinda and Liz, if you could put your heads together, and do the best you can to yeah. <laughs> agree to agree, and let's let's see where we are, and uh, we'll have further discussion. Yeah. Sarah, you got that all in the minutes. I think so. I just want okay. to go through it one more time. Peter, there's no one from the fire department trying to get into this meeting, so I don't know what's going on there. The fire department portion is supposed to start at 6 p.m. Well, let's hope I'll they open up, up a fresh new spreadsheet and I'll try it okay, again. So this is what I have. Do you want me to just run through it yes. really quick? Run through it really yes. quickly? Yeah. So we're gonna leave the HSA contributions as they are. Just gonna leave it like that. And set a cola of four percent. Cut contributions to the paving fund by $10,000, so the contribution will be $20,000. Reduce the contribution to the tennis court fund from $10,000 to $5,000, and remove the $5,000 allocated for unforeseen road repairs, and remove $7,000 from the roadside mowing, bringing it to $7,000. Is there anything I'm missing? Uh, no, just that there's three people that are on a two-person plan, right? There are three people who are on a two-person plan. Okay, and leave leave HSA as it is, but but pay in full for the for the spouse's um, health insurance. Health insurance. insurance premium. Pay premium for how uh, premium for house. Okay. What if you okay. take the cola to three percent? That's another forty eight hundred. It won't oh. get us there. I don't know. Mine is at nine point five, but I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a new a whole new spreadsheet. Um, I didn't save this and uh, and start over with what she just said and see what I come out to. Okay. Well, we can. What are you at, Dorinda? Uh, well, I was. I just changed it to three percent to see what that came out to. Um, and that brings it down to nine point one six, according to me. Mine, if we went to three. If you went to three percent. Nine yeah, but where are you? Where are you? Where are you with the four percent, please? It was ten something, I think. Wow, it can't be no. much if it's only forty eight hundred dollars. I thought it was only yeah forty eight hundred percent. I thought that it was ten point eight eight, Dorinda. Nine point nine point five zero with a four percent. Yeah, that's what I got. Was there nine point five zero? We're there. there. That's it. There. We're there. Well, there. <laughs> okay. It's not that great. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of work to save a couple of percentage points, but I think it was worth the. Uh, I yeah. think it was worth that the effort. Down to nine point five percent. Yeah, nine point yeah. five. With yeah. all those things that you just said, and and might I say, I do want to add, you guys, that by paying double for the spouse, that's a lot of. That's a huge increase. Like Sarah said, I mean, that's really yeah. like a six or seven percent increase overall. Yep. Yeah. We're. The only thing you haven't addressed is, are we not changing anything for the single people? Uh, no. Okay. No. Okay. So what do we here? Yeah, uh, we can we can talk about that another time. The other the other the other unknown item is we haven't decided what we'll pay for people who don't take the health insurance. Oh, the opt out. Yes. Is there anybody who's opting out? No. My husband's company we don't, we don't, am I correct, Dorinda? We don't pay anything now for people who opt out. Oh, we do. We pay um, 1800 Okay. So we, I guess my proposal would be we leave the 1800 
the way it is. Yeah. But we may not want to use it, do they? I'm sorry, what was the question? We may not have anyone who utilizes that. Not That's as correct. of today. Guys, we, we need to uh, conclude our budget discussion uh, budget discussion for tonight. Mm -hmm. um, we're supposed to. I just lost my copy of the agenda on my phone. Great. I lost. <laughs> I'm mine on my phone. <laughs> we were supposed to have Vic's um, thing 15 minutes ago. Right. We're supposed to have Dorinda's a half an hour ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, where are we with the where where are we with the fire department? If they showed up in the way, they they're, they're, they're now here. All right. Okay. What I would what I would suggest is we we have the fire department discussion and then go back to uh, to uh, Victor and Dorinda if that's okay with everyone. Gee, thanks, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. signing off. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Okay. Great discussion. <laughs> as well. Thank you all. Gentlemen, good evening. All right. Good evening. So um, we also have uh, Paul Attenti here with us, uh, zooming into the meeting for the benefit of the, you can probably see him on your uh, on your screen. Um, so Jeff, why don't why don't you uh, why don't you give your report and then we'll have our discussion, our organizational discussion. Okay. Um, as all good things, I prepared this yesterday and numbers changed this morning. So uh, we're up to 68 calls so far this year. Um, we've been out 15 times. We've been mutual aid out once, no mutual aid in. Our max number of responders is, was seven. Min was three and our average was four. Um, engine one was out 11 times. Engine six was out one time. Tanker one was out five times and rescue one was out five times. We had a truck versus deer at the beginning of the, the period. And last this morning we had a truck versus deer, both on I-89, I don't think it was the same deer. Um, we had a, a motor vehicle accident on Lover's Lane and Route 2, which is just across the bridge into Moortown. A chimney fire on McCullough Hill. A motor vehicle accident on 89. Motor vehicle accident on Route 12, um, which the state police ended up canceling us. Um, car versus pole. Uh, that was actually, it came across as 100p and 2 they actually screwed up the address and it was 102 so we got canceled because that's waterbury's response area we had um, a carbon monoxide alarm that was ended up being canceled a vehicle rollover um, on center road a motor vehicle accident uh, a pickup into trees a vehicle fire on mccullough hill road it was a truck fire a uh, carbon monoxide alarm that had gone off two days before on West Hill, and then they called for the fire department. Uh, nothing was found. And then a fire alarm at uh, Paul and Era's old house, which um, we've been there before for this um, same incident. They, around midnight, they start cooking some celebratory meal and smoke up the house, which sets off the fire alarm. Um, and then the uh, the and then we had a rollover Sunday morning um, at uh, six o'clock in the morning. As far as uh, training, <clears throat> we're in December. We flip flop our training and meeting nights because uh, we have our annual meeting uh, on the first Tuesday of the month. So we're doing training tonight, and that's uh, team building exercises. We're making up two teams of the members and um, we're doing some exercises for that. As far as uh, repairs that we've had to do, the problem we thought we had with engine one and its battery tender system ended up only being a plug on the drop cord 
uh, that we were able to fix and there isn't a problem with engine one. Uh, purchases out of the ordinary, our uh, thermostat for the, the bay had to be replaced. And then a, we're waiting on a valve controller for the heating system that allows the water to go out to the, the loops for the, the bay <clears throat> and the training office area. But I What? I don't know uh, who that was. Hey, Jeff. Uh, we have members of the fire department who are working at the vaccine clinic up at Berlin Mall. Uh, the department helped with Toys for Tots, uh, providing gifts to Middlesex families. We have uh, one of our members is enrolled in the, currently enrolled in the EMT course, and I believe her graduation date is in March. Uh, we have two members that completed the District 6 medical first responder course uh, with this Next month, hopefully the legislature will approve this whole system. What that will then allow them to do is respond to calls as fast squad members for um, CPR, bleeding, that kind of thing. Nothing real complicated, but it gives us a little more um, flexibility or a little more people out there to help. Um, our annual meet, like I said, our annual meeting was held on the seventh, the seventh of December, and Eric has been elected new chief. Doug has stepped down from any officer or uh, executive officer uh, positions. He just wants to wear a black hat again. Um, I'm still the president and the assistant chief, and that pretty much sums up. And as normal, Sarah, I'll get this to you. I'll probably get it to you tomorrow once I make the corrections with the added call. Any questions from you all? Thank you, Jeff. Any questions for Jeff? Good report. Thanks. Good report, I agree. Thank you, yeah. Jeff. So some, I guess I, somehow I missed that Eric um, is now the chief. Um, when did that happen? It officially takes place on the 1st of January. Oh, congratulations, Eric. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations, Eric. Great. <clears throat> He's so, building quite a, a campaign fund uh, war chest. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're saying that Doug is still going to be a volunteer on the fire squad? Yep. Yes. yes. In fact, Doug is here tonight, and uh, he was at the 3.30 call this morning and the 6 o'clock call Sunday morning. Wow. And now that he's retired, he can he can go to all the calls. Yeah, thank yeah. you, Doug. Thank you, Doug. So I would I would just uh, I would just like to say, in all seriousness, first of all, thank you, Doug, for all, all your years of service and uh, and all your years of being being chief. And the other thing I'd like to say is, at at some point, and I don't know what the appropriate time is and what the appropriate recognition is, but we should have a little recognition ceremony for uh for Doug. it's been how many years Doug? 32 years 30 years in the, this department yep 30 years wow so, that's amazing doug that's so great congratulations so, it is great so we need to keep that i've i've hold on sarah i've 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 challenged uh jeff to keep that on his radar screen and we need to keep it on our radar screen and maybe we could do so, a little something at our at our next joint meeting a month from now, I don't know, but I'd like to do something for them. Wait till spring. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's wait till spring where we can be outside. Yes. <laughs> Maybe. Yes. That's, sir. that's Doug's. That's Doug's uh, suggestion. Yeah. Is it thirty years on the fire department or thirty years as chief? Thirty, 30 years, years on the department. Ten years as chief. That's so great, Doug. Thank you for your service. Wow. So the other thing we have on uh, tonight's agenda is to <coughs> have further discussion about the uh, potential reorganization of the fire department and how and when and, and what and all that. And uh, in the area of, of full disclosure, uh, I had a telephone call with, with Jeff and Eric last night kicking around and just talking some more about what we discussed at our last meeting when uh, when they weren't there, 
Um, and uh, I'm not putting words in their mouth. I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear from them, but I was, I was telling them uh, more about Phil's idea of moving forward in a collaborative way, not putting a, not putting it before the, not putting it before the voters, uh, with the idea, and and this is this is my date, not Phil's date, but the, the idea that we would try and reach some kind of conclusion by budget time next year, because really the earliest the earliest this change could take effect from a budget point of view would be July first of 2023. So it would be this time next year, budget time when when the world would change, however it would, however it's going to change. What does that mean about not putting something on the uh, agenda? Well, we what, what Phil suggested, we were we were talking about putting the question, putting the question to the town voters whether the town of Middlesex should should uh, take over whatever the whatever the right word is uh, and make it a town fire department instead of instead of the an independent nonprofit. And now you're saying that you don't think we should? Well, Phil brought up the suggestion at our last meeting that he thought doing that was a bad idea. And the more I thought about it, the more I agreed with him. And I thought the sen my sense of the discussion at the last meeting was that pretty much everybody else felt the same way. Now, maybe I got that wrong. No. Um, but that's what, we're, that's what we're here to talk about tonight. But... The more I've thought about it, the more I think if we can do this in a collaborative way with the fire department and agree to agree. So then we just have a select board vote and say effective whatever date and the fire department votes and we do it. That's going to be better than putting it to a town vote when people aren't or likely not to understand what's going on despite our best efforts to have, you know, meetings and all kinds of other things to get the word out. I, I guess I, about that. I, I guess I didn't come to that conclusion. I thought we were going to have the vote and at the same time hope that it was going to be collaborative so we could say everybody agrees to this, but we want the people to vote on it. No, I don't think, I mean, that wasn't what I concluded, Mary, but maybe I, maybe I got it wrong, but I would say, in thinking about it and in talking, we talked for what, about an hour last night, uh, Jeff? Yeah. Uh, and thinking it, trying to think it carefully through, it just seemed to make, the more I thought about it, the more that approach made sense to me rather than putting it to a town, uh, rather than putting it to a town vote. And I would also say, and I'll, I'll let them speak for themselves, but uh, that a fire department liked that approach as well from what I could tell. Yeah, that's the conclusion that we came to that, that we, we've, since we've started having these meetings together, I think we've made uh, leaps and bounds on um, our working relationship with each other and uh, that we'd like to see that continue and discuss um, where, what this new model is going to look like. And the reality is that um, trying to get it to be put on the, the agenda right now doesn't leave, in my mind, does not leave enough time to really get information out to everybody. Um, even if we had weekly meeting, weekly informational meetings, you all are aware how often those are attended by people um, that there's enough common ground in my mind, and I think Eric agrees oh, absolutely. that we can go forward with this way. There's just some things that we need to flesh out. And the reality is considering that the budget's gonna be voted on, uh, you're gonna finalize the budget possibly tonight. And then the budget's gonna be voted on in March that the transition wouldn't happen until effectively um, July 1 of 2023, because the, we've already, we'll have already be partway into that budget process anyway. And so we're, we're kind of too far down the track to, to make that change if it were to happen sooner rather than later. And um, 
the the reality is that there may be very few tweaks on the way things are being done currently that it, it would be with a change. So that's uh, well. That's what right. do you need to flesh out, Jeff? That's what we need to. We that's the thing we need to go over is what are, what is your view of this? What is our view? And then come to a, a common understanding of what what we both think the view in the future of the fire department is going to be, and and also looking at not just next year, but taking and I'm sure Paul would agree with me on this one, taking a look out five years out with the Middlesex increasing, um, where is the fire department going to have to go? With increased uh, town size, it's like I, I didn't, I didn't do a hard thing on fast spot calls. Just a, a real quick count. Um, we've been out on eleven medical only fast spot calls, and if you add the accidents in, we're at twenty for the month. Um, are we going to potentially in a couple of years be looking at doing what East Montpelier did and have their own ambulance service instead of relying on, in their case, it was Barry Town. Um, would we be getting to the call volume where it would be prudent to look at having an ambulance service of our own? So these are the kind of things that we need to, to, to discuss and not just, like I said, not just come up with a short-term next year plan, but not only next year, but looking out, you know, a five-year kind of like a fight it uh, plan for the, uh, where, where you all and where we all see that we need to grow the fire department. Thank you, Jeff. Steve, you have your hand up. Yes, uh, um, I just wanted to say that that what you were saying earlier was right. We we weren't going to do this as far as a town a town vote. We were talking about being collaborative with the fire department and the town. You know, the select board and and working through some of these things. Everything has been very positive coming from the fire department. I'm extremely happy with that. But I, th I think that collaborative, we can work out some of these things and it will never have to go to a town vote, just what we were talking about before. It can be something that uh, between the fire department and the select board, we can make that decision and, and a vote within the fire uh, select board itself and not go to the town. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not opposed to doing it that way. I just thought that at some point, everybody said in the because of transparency, we wanted to have the town weigh in on this change. And so I'm just surprised that now we feel we don't need the town to well, weigh in. Let me let me just say, Mary, I think I think what we're all saying is let's go down the road and see where we get. If this all works out and we're all we're all shaking hands and smiling at each other and agreeing. As, as I said to the gentleman last night when we were talking, the truth of the matter is, is making it a town fire department a significant step? You bet it is. But what really changes? We are, for the most part, acting now as if they are part of the town. We arrange for their insurance. We provide their building. We provide their equipment. Dorinda pays their bills. Um, you know, what, what would really change would be relatively little if we, if we became a town fire department. Right. The way I see it. Yes, Liz. Please I just wanted to hand. clarify to Mary that indeed at the beginning of that conversation that we had, because I too was like, oh, I don't remember that, but I did look back at the minutes and even though Phil had originally said that he wanted to bring it to the voters, the conversation ended up saying that we should instead avoid putting the question on the ballot and approach the fire department. So it is in the minutes for the last meeting. Yep. Um, but I agree with you. I, I sort of forgot that piece as well. So yeah, because I thought we were going to have them work together. That's all. That's the way I remember that conversation. But. But I agree. And, you know, with what Paul was saying um, originally uh, in that original email, Paul Attenti, that 
Um, and I had stated this last meeting as well, that like, if we're going to do something like this for the voters, it has to be very clear what they're voting on, because it's, it's not clear to me. So if it's not clear to me, it's not going to be clear to the voters. Um, and so, um, you know, in terms of the benefits, right, the and and so if we can continue to do, as Steve said, this great communication and, you know, monthly meetings with the fire department, I'm happy with the way things with, with the way things are going. And, uh, am I understanding it correctly that at the end of our collaborative thing, we're going to have both the fire department and the select board vote that they will become a branch of the town of Middlesex. That's, the, that's, that's the goal. Okay, you know, if that, if that, yeah, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. And I also, we, in our conversation last night, I, I emphasized to Jared, Eric and, and Jeff that there's no reason that the nonprofit part of the fire department can't continue and they can do fundraising and engage in uh, other activities for the benefit of the fire department. That, that's exactly what goes on in, in uh, a number of other towns. Gotcha. But that nonprofit would have nothing to do with the uh, town of Middlesex. It would be a support organization for the for the fire department. So, you know, I really the more I thought about this and the more we talked about it and everything else, I just think this is a <laughs> to say that it's less combative, I would say, is an understatement. I, I think it's I think it's a good way to go forward. And and Phil, I commend you for. Uh, for bringing that up the last time, I think you really started turning us all around on this, and I uh, and I really uh, I really appreciate it, and I the fire department also appreciates it. Thank you. So better to be non-confrontational. Yep. Well, and it just the difference between the conversations we're having now and the conversations we were having a year ago is like night and day. True. So, anyway, guys, I. I I don't know. I don't think we need to have a we need to have a vote on that. We just agree that we're going forward, that we're not going to put it on the town meeting day ballot. And let's let's keep these meetings up and let's okay. devise. I think. Uh, I think, Jeff, maybe maybe you and I could could get together off screen and maybe maybe Paul could help us out. and We could come up with a with the steps we need to uh, work on to do this. I'm sure Eric will have some thoughts on it as well. But have some kind of regular plan of how we're going to work our way through this process. Do you want me to, to start to try to capture uh, fast squad calls in with this as well, or just stick with fire department calls for now? Oh no. Cause the fast, I would, I think it'd be great to have the fast squad. The fast squad's an important part of this. Yeah, yeah. really is. Okay. That, and that, like you said, could be a, a bigger piece as we look uh, to the future as to what the, <laughs> As we all gracefully age, right, Phil? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just no, leave it. One, we all one thing I would, <laughs> I would suggest on that, if if we're, if we eventually get to going down that route of, of the ambulance, is East Montpelier is the most recent town that's done that. So we would want to speak with them and see how how things went, what the stumbling blocks were how the financing is going mm -hmm. currently and how it started out because um, yeah. that's a that's a big expense yeah. yeah but by the same token we pay a lot of money to the city of montpelier yeah to okay. provide that service now right. so yeah and anything we can, else we can recruit some recoup some of that by by filling out for insurance but that's yeah. a discussion further down the road yeah yeah yep 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 Anything else, board members or fire department for tonight? Good job. Very good, good job. I, good. And when I say guys, I mean ladies and gentlemen, select board and, and fire department. I think I think this is a good way to go. I really do. So thank you very much. And congratulations to Eric and yes. uh, congratulations to our former chief for all yes. of your hard work. Yes, I agree. Happy holidays. All of you. Yep. Have a good evening. And Paul, I did uh I I did get that 33 page 
thing you sent me, but I have not had a chance to look through it, but I, but I will. Did you share that with the fire department as well? Yes, you did. Yeah. Yes, okay. yes I did. Okay. And, and again, it, down the road, it's, you know, let's having just get you folks thinking about a plan going forward because mm -hmm. we're growing, yeah. you know, it. You, you're in the business, you know, we're growing as a community. Yeah, yep. we are. Well, thank you for sending that over and we will and, and stay involved in this process. Uh, Paul, we welcome your input. Thank we'll you do. all. Okay, I think we're all set with that. Have Thank you, Fire Department. Have a good evening and a good holiday. Hey guys. Happy, Happy Christmas. Christmas. Yes. Yeah, you uh, too. Happy holidays. So I have electronically lost my agenda, so I need a little guidance. I think we should go back to Dorinda and then yes. uh, Victor, who's, who's still waiting in the wings, and then go from there. Yeah, I'll relinquish my spot to Victor because I really don't have a lot. So I don't okay. have anything. Okay. okay. Thank you. Victor, are you still out there? Victor, Victor, Victor. There he is. Yeah. Here I am. Okay. Um, the first thing that I have tonight was uh, a, uh, well, I guess it's a complaint. And uh, it was from Charles Pelcher, and uh, Dorinda can cut in or come in anytime she wants or not. But uh, we got an email from Charles to uh, Shane. It says, to whom may it may concern, when my family and I came down with COVID in September, I was told, I don't say by who, but would not have to worry about going into the negative on sick time even if I needed time off for an illness before being back into the positive. I had to take a few hours off recently that I marked as sick time, but was charged for vacation hours. I would appreciate it if my vacation hour times would go back so, so I could use it for actual vacation time. Thank you, Charles Pelcher. And what happened was, which it doesn't say in this email, but which has come out that he um, took three hours off. Uh, six. What's that? Six. six. Six hours off. And that was to take his child to the emergency room. And, okay. uh, but anyways, um, so it came out that one one issue is uh, one issue is uh, the COVID thing, and um, you know taking taking your child to the emergency room is not a COVID activity. Uh, I know I've talked to Peter about this. He has a different view, um, but. Uh, he also worked how many hours overtime? He worked eight hours overtime. Okay, which, um, and we paid him for eight hours of overtime, correct? Yes. Okay, which if he took, which it says in our, in our uh, employee policy on page nine, uh, sick time cannot be used to cover a shortage in hours worked. So he should have, got straight time for those six hours as far as overtime goes. And, um, so and two, hours, two hours of overtime and six hours of straight time instead of eight hours of overtime. Correct. And no. it says, what's that? Got the hours wrong. He physically worked 48 hours. When I received his time sheet, it had been totaled to 34 regular hours, six hours sick time, and 14 hours of overtime. And so after we made the adjustments, because they weren't eligible, number one, they were not eligible for overtime until they physically worked 40 hours. So that got reduced from 14 to eight. His original, what he had on his timesheet was 48 
hours of working time. Then he added in six hours of sick time, which should not have been on there to begin with in the first place because we only pay on a 40 hour work week. He did not receive overtime pay or that, but I switched it from sick time to vacation time because my understanding when we discussed this COVID situation was they could go into the hole for COVID. And then if something came up in the future when they ran out of time, we would discuss how we would handle it as we have done previously with other one other employee that I know of. Um, and that was kind of how it was handled. And, but that person who had gotten, gone into the negative before was out of vacation time and everything. And that's why it got switched. But to be honest with you, he shouldn't have even gotten those six hours in any form of pay because that is buying back time. That is not something the town does. So, he shouldn't have gotten it either way, but I figured the hours were there. He had put them down rather than create another issue, which in hindsight did create another issue. Um, I switched it from sick time because he was already negative sick time. And it was not a sick, it wasn't like he was sick. This was personal time he was taking. Well, I would, I would say that if you had sick time, I would use my sick time to take my kid to the ER. I mean, that's sick time is for that as that's well. Fine. But are you well, saying he actually physically got dollars for those vacation out? You changed it to vacation. So there was money in his paycheck for those. If you were to just walk, take it out altogether and just say he used his, he's already worked his 40 plus hours why does he even record it at all that he used sick time during the day if he worked? So just make it be a wash, but he is going to probably lose money because you paid him for his vacation. But if you take that out, you just don't pay him. Right. So that's what happened. Technically, he shouldn't have been paid, but I could not get, I tried calling Shane. I couldn't get hold of him at the time we were processing payroll. So I just moved it. I did bring Shane. Shane showed up at the office later. I went through everything with him um, and showed him how everything was calculated and that was where it was left. And, but technically he shouldn't have put, I mean, once somebody physically works 40 hours, anything over that is overtime and there shouldn't be sick or vacation or personal or anything put right. into that. Right. So it, it's, so technically now he's gotten paid six extra hours. So there's two ways to handle it. We can deduct six hours from his pay next week and put everything back to where it was. Or he can take that six hours vacation. And I mean, I guess we can move it if that's the thing. But once again, that is not how, and this yeah, is where know. I'm really having a difficult time. The we rewrite this personnel policy every time an issue comes up and there's nothing in that personnel policy that says how these situations are supposed to be handled. And I'm the one that's put on the, the hot plate for making, following the rules that are in the book. Right. And so um, part, that is the, where the frustration's coming in. The part of this that rings true to me is if he's already worked his 40 hours of straight time and a little bit of overtime, how does he get to put in for six hour sick time? Well, why, isn't that just, why isn't that just his time? I don't know. I don't know. And all the, the time sheets all came in totaled with all the invitation. They were not based overtime on the work week. They were all totaled with overtime based on the day. So all every time sheet had to be adjusted. I think we should explain this to him and tell him that we're giving him back his vacation hours, but we're taking away the pay. It does not make sense for him to, to claim, even if he had sick time, 
to use that when he's already worked his hours. That just makes no sense to use that up. Yeah. So he just needs to be informed that we're going to deduct those six hours and unrelated to, I mean, if, what, if he does overtime next week, I don't know if that's going to happen, but you just take out six straight hours of pay if that's possible, adjust it. So here's, here's what I would suggest. I would suggest we give him the Chinese dinner approach. Number one, you can accept that that six hours was taken out of your vacation time and you've been paid for it. And we want you to understand that in the future, that isn't the way you calculate sick time or vacation time. Because if you've worked that much straight time, you're not entitled to get sick time or vacation time. But what's happened has happened. Uh, but choice number two is we'll give you back, we'll give you back your six hours of vacation time, but we're going to take it away from your next paycheck. Yeah, there's no freebies here, I don't think. Sarah. Isn't that what Liz just said? Are you just saying the same thing or are you saying something yeah, different? I'm saying the same thing, but I'm saying, <laughs> but I'm saying give him the, give him the choice. On, on his bank, but he doesn't, but he you, he has to, he gets six hours of pay deducted from his next uh, paycheck. Yeah, and his vacation given back to him. His six hours given back to him for vacation. Yeah. Randy. Randy? He's unmuting. Uh, sorry. Um, just a suggestion. It, it seems like there may be, uh, you know, Shane as, as the supervisor, um, it may be beneficial to run through this at that level um, because I'm assuming that he's approving their timesheets before they even get to Dorinda. Um, so maybe there's some confusion there that needs to be cleared up. I think there is. I agree. Because it, it sounds like there's a couple issues and, and sounds like, and, and maybe I picked this up wrong in the conversation, but it sounded like they were computing overtime on a daily rate instead of on a weekly rate. And then the next comp piece of that conversation is, you know, if you're, if you're over your 40, you're not claiming any additional time, sick or, or vacation. Right. Yes, Dorinda. I also want to add, he did it on the following week as well. He worked 45.5 hours and then put in for three vacation hours. Isn't well, there another issue here, though? Yes. yes. Is there another issue, Dorinda, in the fact that, uh, and, 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 and Liz just said, uh, I think he should be able to put in uh, sick leave if uh, he's uh, taking, uh, taking his uh, uh his child to the to the uh, emergency room, uh, but that's not what that's not what, that's not what the plan says. That's not what the policy says. The policy says that it's just for the uh, for the uh, the employee to take for sickness or injury, and the idea, as I understand it, is that's why you get three days uh, personal. At the beginning of the year to do things like that. I don't know. I've never heard of a policy where you can't use your sick day when your kid is sick. Yeah. Well, federal, federal law that's because you know, allows for that. Yeah. That may just be an assumption, Vic. That is that's that's not even that. Yeah. Okay. I, what I've never what heard is an assumption? What is an assumption? Um, that it's assumed that sick days can be used for your immediate family members who are sick. I thought that was sort of a law too. Like, I think I'm fairly, I'm fairly certain that Phil is right, that it is, it falls under that, uh, the federal guidance for that. Yeah. However, medical leave. Right. So yeah. the point for him though, is if he doesn't have sick time and it's not COVID related, then the pol at least any place of employment that I've been at, you're not you, you're not allowed to go into the negative there. You're right. taking your personal or vacation time to compensate for that. Yep. Well, and you're also not allowed to when you've already worked 40 hours, you're not right. allowed to push that into the overtime category. Correct. Or push some no. of the 40 hours into the overtime category. Correct. Well, what's yes, Steve. I have two questions. Um, one is if he 
hadn't had to take his child to the emergency room and he worked at six hours, would he have had 14 hours in overtime? Would have had, no, no, because no. he told the timesheets were totaled on overtime per day and not overtime per. Uh, so he only ended up with, and he's not the only one that did it. The same thing happened with Jay. The only thing was, Jay's all went in as vacation hours, but they put in for more than 40 hours per week. Okay. Is what they had did on these sheets. But, um, but so no, I mean, the way the sheet came through, it originally said 14 hours overtime because it was totaled by the day. If oh. they had not, he should have bottom line then 40 hours regular pay eight hours overtime would he have had overtime that day if he would have worked if he had worked yeah okay that was my question the second thing is that i'd like to oh. know is how did these how are they in the hole on sick time why he's he's the only one in the hole on sick time because he went in the hole when this happened. He went in, he went in the whole 40 hours on uh, September 3rd, the week of September 3rd. He went in another 30 hours on the week of September 10th, another four and a half hours on the week of 1126. Was that COVID related? Those and they were all put into sick time because they said COVID. And so I'm sorry, did we did we have some thing that was like, it was only if you didn't have enough hours and it was COVID related, we would pay for you or something? No, yes. we said, we said if it was COVID related, we would allow the employee to go in the hole on a Oh, go in the hole. Okay. Right. Um, did would we allow them to go in the hole if they weren't vaccinated or is everyone vaccinated? Because I, I just want to say, people are about to get sick. All of us are about to get the Omicron, and we may have a lot of sick people, and we probably need to have that discussion. And what we might also want to consider is something like a sick bank. If there's people who have lots, of, they've been there forever, and they've got so many hours that they don't know how to use them, that they could donate hours to a sick bank. But I'm telling you, you guys, we're in for potentially some people being sick and out well let's i i agree with you liz but let's let's talk about how we're going to handle this problem and how we're going to handle our payroll administration going forward and then talk about what our future i like there's, I, there's choice options so how do we handle this does dorinda meet with shane and then shane or does Dorinda meet with Shane and Victor and then Shane and Victor deliver the news to Charles? How are we going to do it? That sounds right. Yes. Yeah. I think it's more than just it, it's, I think it has, and I tried to explain this to Shane when he was in the office. The first issue is calculating the hours he needs to understand, which I think he does now. I gave him another copy of where it's stated in the personnel policy that they have to work 40 hours. But once that top line hits 40 hours, they're done. If it doesn't hit 40 hours, then they couldn't put in for this other time, but they wouldn't have overtime if they didn't work that 40 right. hours. Right. The only exception to the rule is during a holiday week. And we do count a holiday as time work. Right. right. And I think that's the federal law also, I believe. Yeah. So. But does that work for you? Does that work for you, Victor? I have no problem other than uh, changing your sick leave policy to say that uh, you can use it for your siblings. That's siblings. That's I, I believe that's federal law, though, Victor. We don't have we don't have any say on that. Yeah, but what you're saying in, in there is conflictatory to that. It's conflicting with that statement, with that. I, I don't care. I agree. I know I used it right. forever for, for, you know, if I had to take somebody to the hospital I'd, or my kid or 
spouse or whatever. Uh, I, I don't disagree with you, but it's just not worded in there that way. Right. So you're saying that the policy conflicts with the federal law and it says that you can only use it for, yes. the, for the employee yeah. itself. Right. It doesn't it really use the word you can only. only use it. It doesn't, doesn't say, say the word only. only. No. It, it says not. an employee may use sick leave for illness or injury that prevents the employee from performing their the employee's duties. So it doesn't go beyond that. It, right. But the word only is not used. Sarah. In the past, the board has had these discussions about yeah. eliminating the term sick time for, by putting in paid time off PTO so that you don't have to get into these HIPAA violations of saying, well, were you sick and how so were you sick, which is what the employer should not be asking. So you guys probably need to go revisit the personnel policy again. The problem with paid time off is that they will use all their paid time off for vacation and then they won't have any sick time. Yeah. I'm against paid time off. Yeah, I think that's kind of work stuck with the personnel policy that you have. I think you've already had this discussion at least once or twice. I think it all, we have too. It all comes back. We're just going around and around and around, but the employer doesn't have any right to start poking into the employees' of personal sick affairs. And I think that Vic, we're not disagreeing that he could, if he had needed sick time and he had it, that he could use it to take his kids to the ER. No one's disagreeing with that. It's just that personal, the problem is our personnel policy doesn't say that though, Liz. But but, but, that, but he wasn't assuming that. Go ahead, that's, go ahead. We know go ahead, Dorinda. I'm sorry. That's not what happened. Nobody would have taken it away. The only I think the bigger question is say he goes out and stubs his toe tomorrow and can't work. How do we handle that? Does he have to use up his vacation time? Because the original discussion was he could only go in the hole for, for well, COVID-related issue. And that is not his understanding. He believes no matter what, he can go in the hole for sick time. That isn't what we agreed to. Well, that is not what's understood. Am I correct? You're going to have that conversation with Shane and Victor, and Victor going to talk to to Charles about it. I mean, in all fairness to Shane, and he's not here tonight, um, I had a discussion with him for a couple of hours this morning uh, in his office, and he 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 uh, he understands. It. I I truly believe he understands how it's supposed to go. Now. So, I mean, we can still meet with him and uh, I don't have any problem with that, but I'm sure he will uh, will agree with us. But is he clear with how future sick time will be handled? I believe so. Okay. And that's what I'm going to We told him. We told him. And, because uh, I, it, I was told that he was told that no matter what, his sick time was covered. Yeah, I understand that. But I think it's been discussed since you and him talked. Okay. I think we re, re, you know, rehashed it. And then we talked this morning. So I think it's okay. He did say this morning that after the first of the year, he's going to petition the select board to change it to uh, overtime over eight hours. We'll see how that goes. That is will, we, will we also petition for a five-day work week to, to make that happen? He didn't mention that. <laughs> I mean, that is. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I misspoke. He on a 10 hour day, he wants uh, he wants You know, when uh, when they are working four days a week, if they get the day off, he wants to get 10 hours for that day instead of eight. That's completely against all of the uh, what we pay for vacation and sick time and all. I but you still can ask the question. Well, then okay, look, we're getting off onto something different. Yeah. Right. right. So quickly, and I'm not saying we need to decide on it tonight, but we need to. I agree with Liz. I think this new COVID thing is gonna is gonna sweep through here, and God only knows God only knows what's gonna happen. There are gonna certainly gonna be some breakthrough cases, even on the people who are vaccinated. So. We ready? We better be ready for this. So, if if what we said before was we would allow them to go in the hole on their sick time 
for COVID related things, COVID related illnesses, are we going to limit that? Or are we going to say it's on? I mean, what happens if one of them gets sick for three months? Are we going to pay them for three months? We can't do that. That doesn't make sense. Hold on a minute, uh, Randy. We need to we need to have a real policy for this. I'm sorry, I'm I'm sideways. I had to plug in my iPad. The battery was going dead. Um, well, what would we do if someone had a heart attack? How would we handle that? Would we pay them when they're out? If they sick would, time. If they had sick time, and I do know in the past you guys have done. Um, Correct. With a former employee, after all their vacation time was used up, you did allow them to go in the hole. But I think you do need some kind of cap on this because you just can't let it go on forever and ever. Right. Um, I'm like, some, I, on a regular basis, long term or short term disability kicks in. So, um, you know, but I, you just. I mean, it's really hard to sit there on Monday mornings and process this payroll when you're trying to, you know, go by. I what think it's we bad. need a discussion on this on a different night. Like, the, but yeah. I think we need to discuss this and have it be on the agenda Soon. that we talk about this. Soon. Soon, and also anybody right. who has time to do any research on what other towns might be doing, or whether VLTC has any recommendations on how to treat this. They probably do. Can I yeah. just ask a quick question? Are we as a town under the Family Medical Leave Act so that, you know, they 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 still can have their job, um, you know, if if there's a catastrophic illness or whatever, mm -hmm. um, they don't get paid, but they don't lose their job? Or is that with 200 or more employees? I can't remember. Well, we have it in our personnel policy that eligible okay. employees may receive it. So I would okay. assume yes. Yeah. So I think what we want to think about is like a COVID, a, a cap on the COVID days of what you can go into the negative, because it's not fair to the employee either. They'll never catch up. Right. And we can't afford to pay them for that many sick days. That's not how our budget works. Right. And and so we have to have some sort of cap. But I think we can all, you know, pretty much assume that someone is going to be out. And if God willing, it's minor, but they still may be out for six days. Right. And they may not have six vacation. I mean, they may not have six um, sick days. Um, would, the, would the long and short term disability coverage that we have, Dorinda, kick in at some point with the COVID? Um, I, I think it's after so many weeks. I don't think it's days. It's like, weeks. I mean, I think it's like, like three months. Days. Is it that loud? I think it's like three around? months for short, short, for short term. I know term. it's something that's, yeah, it's um, short term, I think maybe weeks and long term is months, something but to that, that effect. If, if that's possible to check that, that would be helpful as well. Randy? Yeah, so I was just going to ask whether or not uh, we allow employees in the current policy, do we allow employees to roll over or, or accrue a set amount of sick time and what that number is. Um, for example, my employer allows uh, an accrual of a maximum of 720 hours. And the That's thought be the thought behind that is that that 720 hours um, will get any employee to the long term disability if they were ever in that situation. Yep. Yep. And that's what we're at. That's what we're at. It says that uh, you, your uh, employee does not use, if an employee does not use all the employee's sick leave in a year, the employee may carry up to six days, 48 hours of unused sick leave into the following year. An employee may accumulate a maximum of 90 days, 720 hours of sick leave. So you are correct. So that's probably when the long term disability kicks in, I bet. Right. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Yep. So yep. that that six days is what they accrue every year. Yes. Okay. Hey guys, I think that honestly, I hate to say this, but if we want to come up with some policy, we probably need to meet next week because this is moving so fast. No, oh, come on, it's Christmas oh. week. It's no. No. Isn't this Christmas week? No well, yeah, I have a suggestion. Whatever. All right, I have a suggestion. I 
I say, I say 14 days they can go in the hole for COVID. Well, starting from when? You guys, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you've gotta make a this. You gotta warn something like this. Right. Okay, but I'm maybe I'm I'm just throwing out an idea, and we can vote on it at our next meeting or whatever. I know that. I'm not okay. saying we're we're ruling on it today, but I mean, I'm not thinking we put in a month or two or three months. I well, don't know. Where would that I, get us short-term coverage, uh, Dorinda? No, I, I don't have it off the top of my head. I'll have to see if it's in our insurance book. Might, might I suggest, Peter, that you look at it in a number of hours? Yeah, that's probably better, Randy. I agree. Yep. But let's find out what our short-term disability, if any, is. I thought we had short and long-term. We do. Do. No. But do they pay so for what, it, or do they get to what choose What the it? typical... I, I can tell you from my experience what the typical short-term disability is, <laughs> first day accident, eighth day sickness, but who knows what we have, what we have. We need to find out before we yeah. make a decision on this. So I am against, I'm against Liz having a meeting next week. Okay, that's fine. We can, but can, I just we can do this in two weeks. We can make it retroactive. Mm -hmm. We can do whatever, but we need to formalize this. I agree. But can I just ask a question? Are the, um, does Dorinda, is everyone automatically get short term and long term? Because like I have to pay for that. And so I have to make a choice about that. It costs us like something like between, we get life short term and long term. And um, it costs the, depending on the age of the employee and how much they make and all of that, it ranges. But so it costs the town anywhere from two hundred and eighty dollars up to three hundred and some dollars um, a year for that, and the employee pays six dollars a month. And they and they, they choose to do that, or it's automatic. They have no, to. it's automatic. Okay. Included. In, All right. That's what it's there for. Not for us to put them in the hole for three months of sick time. No, it's not. And the other thing is, and I mean, and this is typical wherever you go. I mean, it's not just here. People use their sick time rather than their vacation time all up front. And, you know, and that's why there's never sick time available. And that is a standard thing. And mm -hmm. I mean, I managed a company for 20 years and... They didn't have a lick of sick time. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to do that. I, I know, but, sick but that's what I'm saying. That's why there's not sick time available when something happens. Mm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think yep. we're picking up a dead horse. Let's move on. I agree. Yeah. So does someone have a printed a printed agenda in front of I, them? What's our next agenda item? Well, Peter, I, I, don't know. I don't think Victor's done. No. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, he isn't done. You're right. Go ahead, Vic. Okay. Um, Shane got a quote from, uh, we don't have, we don't have uh, any heat over in the building next to the fire station where the graders park. And we have, uh, they can't, Bourne says they can't repair the heaters in the main garage anymore because whatever they do, it just doesn't work. So they need to be replaced. Um, the quote for the garage is six thousand, uh, roughly six thousand two hundred fifty dollars plus uh, another two hundred fifty because they need a lift. Now, I don't know why they just didn't quote it all, but they say in their their quote that uh, that they want a lift, so that'll be two hundred fifty dollars extra. I don't know. I've talked to Shane and. Um, I don't know. Is we need heat where the grader is? It was the idea was to start it. But uh, there's, uh, I mean, you can put a heater on it if it doesn't already. He was going to check it out to see if there was. Uh, but those things start pretty good anyways. Uh, are, we t are we talking about the old fires, the old town garage? We're talking about the old town garage with the side where the grader is. Right. Hey. That, that, building, that building has virtually zero insulation. <laughs> Insulation in it. I mean, heating. Okay, we should put, right, a, right. We should we, put a block heater on the grater. 
That's correct. That's we all agree to that. But anyway, so it's six thousand bucks to do the other one, the 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 main garage. And they don't. And do we want to put it off for a year and hope we can limp this one along? Uh, it's it's possible, but we just wanted to get your. Uh, which building are you talking about? We're talking about the town garage, the real the town, town garage. Real town garage, okay. Yeah. There's so, no heat in there? Excuse me? There's no heat in the real town garage? Yes, there is right now, but it's uh, it's very poor shape. And, and uh, if we're going to, uh, Born said that if they, uh, they just can't fix it anymore. It's just beyond Anything they fix just just breaks again. So, what exactly is wrong? Do we know? We don't. We don't. They're just old, old, and parts aren't, aren't readily available, and the technology no longer works. But uh, well, the thing that's so here's the thing that's unfortunate. You know, we're we're trying to go through this this uh, capital plan. And we're trying to think about things like this. And one of the questions is, one of the big questions and that is, what do we do with that building? And I would, I would hate to put $6,000 into two brand new heaters and then decide a year from now that we need to tear that building down. Okay, so, so that's, the answer, that's the answer to your question right there. We'll try to limp along with the heaters. The good news is there are two heaters. So if, if one heater fails, there's there's still heat in there. It isn't maybe full heat, but there's still heat. Yeah. And uh, I just, until we reach some kind of conclusion about what we're going to do with the town hall, are we going to completely renovate it? Or we're going to, and if we're going to completely renovate it, what's the heating system going to be? Right. Those, those modines are hideously inefficient. Right. Always have been. Always and I don't have. think the new ones are any better than the old ones. They may be new, but they're no more efficient. I'm not sure on that. But. No, and I'm not either. I'm not a... I mean, the good news the, the good news is if we really get in trouble, they can use, you know, they can use temporary heat. They can do all kinds of things. But I am against spending $6,000 right now. And I know we're going into the coldest part of winter and all that, but... What does everybody else think? I was going to suggest that maybe, uh, I mean, Bournes gave him that, that uh, they're the ones who've been working on the heaters. There's other people that, that I mean, Bournes has apparently given up on repairing them. They're saying they're beyond repair. Yes. Okay. That's and, and this this proposal is they did, you know, they checked them out last year. I think Shane said that it was last year they said that or the year before. And they're going on what they saw th at that time. And then we're we're assuming, we're assuming that they they, they have provisions in there if uh, if everything is good, the pipings, everything is good, this is what the price would be. But if it isn't, they got its time and materials. And this could be another one of those uh, uh, estimate of six thousand dollars that we pay uh, ten thousand dollars. You know how that works. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I just brought it up to let you know, or or we did, I should say, uh, just to let you know that uh, we'd gotten an estimate on it and uh, in the situation that. Uh, well, the other it way be repaired. The, the other way to look at this is. They're not both going to fail simultaneously, right? So if one fails and it can't be repaired, we buy one new one. Yeah. That's that cuts the cost in half right there. It doesn't. That's like buying a few greater tires then. Yeah. Right. I mean, we got to have we got to have heat in there. There's no question yeah. about that. Yeah. Are you going to have frozen? So so what I mean, we we might make it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. There you go. So, so Vic, we need to talk about the, we need to talk about Rupert's Rock and that section of right. road up there. Correct. Yeah. So, this is this is the old situation about the Class Four section of Bear Swamp Road, which leads from the north end to the parking lot at uh, going up the mountain. 
Hunger Mountain. Barking. Hunger Mountain. And the problem is that in the spring and fall and early and early winter, people drive through there and it turns into a goddamn mud bog. And we had conversations in the past about, you know, won't the state come help us fix up that section of road? The state asked us to to upgrade the road and plow it to the parking lot. Um, there's never been any res resolution and the problem is ongoing. Um, and I'm sorry, I can't think of the fellow's last name, but his first name is Rupert, is the guy who has the house there. Hey. And what he wants to do is with his tractor, push a rock over and block the road off so they can't go up there. Well, when we've, when we've blocked off the road in the past, what happens is everybody plucks, parks in the road and also in the snowplow turnaround, and that causes a horrendous problem. And the third part of it is that there are a number of people, and I don't know if this is still true, but the last time we went around on this, there were a number of people who have, have camps in that section of road, and they want to be able to get in there during deer season. So, and, and probably all winter, not just, not just deer season, get to their, get to their camps. So I don't know what the answer to this is, but we've got a, we've got a gigantic mess and problem on our hands once again, is what I'm saying. The only thing I would add to that, Peter, is uh, forest and parks and recreation, Walter, uh, he wanted us to close it off too. And he has a sign and I think the sign says, uh, you know, some of the effect that you not to drive beyond uh, Rupert's. Uh, uh, Turn around. Yeah, but then do we do we block off the other end of the road as well, or do we leave the other end of the road? No, we're on? not. We're not talking about. No, no, I don't think we ought to block off either. You remember what happened to McCullough Hill Road when we blocked it off both ends? Yeah. yeah. What? I don't want a reoccurrence of that. What happened? People were screaming at us. Had to neighbors, down. Were, yeah, but neighbors were mad at neighbors. It was terrible. Yeah, it was terrible. Yeah. How about you put a sign, uh, just a sign up that says it's not um, not travelable by motor vehicle? Or how about the road's not plowed? You travel at your own risk. Wait, but wait a minute. I must be misunderstanding what you're talking about. I thought you were talking about past Jan's house, like, you know, once you, you're past the parking lot of Hunger Mountain, the second parking lot. And then you have that, you know, basically the beaver area that gets flooded. No, 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 no. What are you talking about? This is the section, <laughs> basically the section of road where the class four section of the road, which starts at the turnaround by Jan's house. But that Rupert takes you is to on the, the class. Lot. Rupert's house is on the class four section of the road. Yeah, but you can't block that off because that's where the parking lot of Hunger Mountain is. Why not? And it's not plowed, so you can't go there in the winter. So everybody parking lot isn't plowed in the winter. We're just yes. going to block it off in the winter. The turnaround at the bottom of Rupert's uh, driveway, and then they walk in to do the hike in the winter. Yeah, right. Rupert plows it for us on purpose. He makes a whole parking area for hike for winter hiking. He does, he does not. He does not plow the part that goes from his turnaround to where you start hiking and where the summer parking lot is. He doesn't. Yeah. So what are about, you suggesting? How about this? How about we tell Rupert to put a rock in the road and put Walter's sign on it and hope that makes it better. Who's and Walter? Rupert, Walter's Walter the guy. Walter is Forest Parks and Recreation. Forest Parks and Recreation. Yeah. Let's try it. I, I'm sorry, what is the problem? The problem is that people drive through to the parking lot and it gets so muddy that people get stuck in there. You mean they, they drive to the parking lot in the win in the bad season, not the summer. Yes, You're talking right. like winter. Yes. Okay. Yes. Rupert has to go pull them out, he thinks. Yeah. I see. Okay. So but we're not talking in the dead of winter when there's snow. No one's driving through there. Correct. Right. Well, you put you would put the rock there in the fall and pull it out in the spring. Yep. Do it. Do yeah. it. You've got somebody, Patty, with her hand up, I think. Yeah, you Sorry. put a rock. You put a rock in there, and we're not going to be able to get rescue vehicles through there when one of them fall up on Hunger Mountain and we have to go in and, and hike it. We're not going to get an ambulance. We're not going to get any of our equipment through there. I've been you on a couple of calls. 
yeah, but you can't. And I'm sorry, I can't see. I can't see who you are. You're not on my screen. I apologize. Um, but last name. in the winter time, you can't you can't get in there anyway. Right, but we're only the, talking about we're only talking about late in the fall and through the winter. And then it would come out in the spring when everybody's going in hiking. Yes. Okay. Who who but, is Patty? I am on the fire department. What's your last name, Patty? O'Neill. Hi, Patty. I don't see your face. I don't Thanks see. Thanks for coming, Patty. You're yeah, welcome. Um, Thank you. Patty, Patty's, uh, Patty doesn't have her face. She just has her um, hand up. and um, yeah. I, I don't know how to get that down. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> I know. You have to lower it. You have to go under. Oh, um, there we go. Did it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I don't, for some reason, I don't see on my screen. Yes, uh, Liz. Liz. Sarah. I had to go downstairs and get a cup of water. What did you guys decide to do about the unheated fire at the unheated garage? Nothing, Nothing. at the moment. Okay. Let it limp along. No action taken. Okay. So Victor, will you get will you get back to Rupert and, and Walter and tell them that's what we're gonna do? So far. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. You know what Rupert could do? He could also um you know, put up a um, a gate, right, mm. and close it. He and can't then, do that. No, on a that, road. That's not Rupert. Rupert can't do that. We would have to put up the gate. We'd have to do it, right? I'm just saying he could volunteer. I think the, to do it. from what Rupert says, his tractor is strong enough, and that rock is big enough that it'll do the job. And I'm taking him at his word. He seems to know what he's talking about. Yeah. Okay. His last okay. Ron. That, are you all set, Vic? Um, yeah, I am. There was a couple other things, but they can come up next next time. Yeah. Yeah. Randy, you had something? Are you gonna set timelines for that? I'm just the the only reason I say that is because I can I can totally see like uh, a point in time when um, the select board is going to be faced with complaints because somebody didn't move the rock and they don't feel like moving we can the always, rock. Or... We can always move the rock, but the bottom line is, as you know very well and we know, when the appropriate time to put the rock in is weather related and the appropriate yeah. time to take it out is weather related. So to say we're going to leave it there from December 1st until April 30th, yeah, I don't think it's the right approach. We just have to that use work. judgment. Well, you know, um, also we the, get the hiking we get complaints. The, the hiking the first... has recommendations of dates for hiking too. So, yeah, there's not supposed to be any hiking on the mountain till uh, Memorial Day weekend. Right. So by then, it should be dry enough, but. Yeah. <clears throat> Moving on. Well, it's a little formal, Randy, but it has it has worked pretty well in the past. And since we stopped blocking off the road, it's been a real problem. So we have a citizen who's willing to handle us for us. So you used to do this anyway. Yes, correct. Oh. I don't remember that at all. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what you're telling me, uh, sir. When the hiking trail used to go right by Jan's. Original. We're moving on. <laughs> okay, guys, we need to move on. What's next on the agenda? Bye, Phil. Merry Christmas. The uh, the uh, approving the minutes of the December seventh select board meeting. Move approval. Second. Moved by Mary. Seconded by Steve. All in favor of approving those minutes, please say aye. 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 Next, Sarah. Renewing the certificate of approval for the location of the Bolduc salvage yard. I'm going to need you guys to come in and sign this when you do this. Nothing has changed. Same place. They just have to do this every five years. Who moved? Um, move. Who moved? I did. Winner. Is there a second? Second. Second by Steve. All in favor of approving the, what is it, a resolution for the certificate, the certificate of approval of the location of the Bullduck salvage yard. Do they have to have proof of insurance or anything like that? 
That's not, I mean, he just really needs this to send to the state. So I'm sure the state is going to have to review the proof of insurance. Okay. Yeah. I still like that my motion. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay. Can you guys find some time, some, I uh, just, just before the year to somebody to come in and sign this? I don't know when he needs it, but probably soon. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, this, this brings up just one quick thing. I am, uh, I am here in Colorado to the 30th. So three of you could sign the uh, orders down at the uh, town hall. That would be good. I looked them over. They look fine to me, but I can't sign them in Colorado. Sarah, are you at the office tomorrow? Yep. Okay. And what about Thursday? No. Okay. I'll be in tomorrow. How early do you get into the office, sir? Nine. Okay. Tomorrow I'm coming in the morning. Late. <laughs> yeah okay no. you're gonna come in late you said no i'll be there at nine okay next item discussing continued use of remedy school as allowed for the town's 2019 easement and i just want you to know that in classic chris mcveigh fashion he emailed me uh while during the meeting um a uh, letter that I suppose I should read to you. And I think this is an issue that, he, I guess he has redone the easement or something. Um, uh, so do you want me to just quickly read the letter since? Yes. Since, okay. Uh, okay. In follow, dear colleagues, in follow up to the Tuesday, December 6, 2021 select board meeting. I don't think that's the right date, but that's okay. I contacted interim superintendent, uh -huh. right, Jennifer Miller Arsenault and discussed the easement <clears throat> problems of access to the Rumney building and grounds, which were discussed during the select board meeting. I believe Sarah Merriman previously shared this email with you. I've attached a copy of Jennifer e email to the town clerks addressing access to the elementary schools, including Rumney for town meeting. And you guys as members of the BCA were all sent that as well. <laughs> so in answer to the questions that were posed, the request for, uh, for the clerks of the five towns to mail the ballots was made to coordinate all of the ballot made mailing. So each town population was assured of receiving the ballots at roughly the same time and in the same manner. It was an effort to ensure a uniformity of delivery of the ballots for registered voters in each of the towns. Okay. The December 15th, 2021 deadline was created to ensure there was some leeway for receiving votes from the various towns as there is a hard deadline of January 25th, 2022. The activity needed to prepare for the mailing and soliciting the res respective town's approval coupled with a school board meeting already scheduled for December 15th, 2021 played a role in selecting the December 5th, 2021 deadline. I have no idea what he's talking about, but that's okay. I've also attached a proposed procedure for access to the Rumney Memorial School and the school grounds as preserved in the easement. I've attached the copy of the easement for informational purposes. I've shared this proposed procedure with interim superintendent Miller Arsenault and now the Middlesex select board for feedback. Please return comments to me by Friday, January 7th, 2022. By copy of this letter, blah, blah, blah. I asked for her comments. So in other words, we just got this tonight while you're in the meeting. There's no way to warn it. I think that January 4th gives you enough time to read this and uh, have comments back to Chris by January 7th. And it has to do with ensuring, from what I could just briefly tell, access to Rumney School, which I think, Peter, is your concern, was your concern about for the, um, I don't know what it's got here. Well, my uh, concern was we got, we got some kind of letter or response saying that we would be able to use the uh, gym at the school and the bathrooms only for our town meeting. Right. And that is way out of compliance with the easement and doesn't address any of the other potential uses that the town might want to use the school for. So I said, if the, if the current thing is COVID related, you know, probably we can make it work for this year, but I want to have some real understanding that the town is going to have reasonable access to that school for any of its regular activities, whether they be band concerts or community meetings or whatever it is. And you know, we've had ever since, ever since, whenever it was a year and a half ago, when uh, when we entered into this agreement, we're forced to enter it, this agreement, giving away our school. Um, there have been a lot of no's and very few yeses about use of that building, and that is not what that easement says. So, <laughs> I will read. I will pay attention to reading that over. I would suggest. Uh, let me read it over quickly, and then probably we should send it to Rob and have him read it over. I think I so. Heard. 
I'm not an expert on easements, but yeah. I well, want to enforce I, our <laughs> easement that was part of that contract. I don't I don't think we should sign anything that somehow limits what we got in the original easement. So just to be clear, this isn't an easement. We've already done the easement. This is a procedure for town of Middlesex and its residents access to the Rumney Memorial School pursuant to easement. So it sounds like an easement of an easement. And you will get, I will forward this all to you tonight. You can limitation on the easement. I'm saying you don't have a description um, if you if you were going to follow the words of the easement. That's all I'm saying. It's going to make it harder for us to use the building. Just that's just my impression from the way it sounds. Well, and I haven't looked at it yet, so we'll. But we need to pay attention. Okay, so I will send it to Rob. I'll send the whole thing to Rob, and then I'll be able, we'll be all ready for the January fourth meeting when I'll put it on the agenda to discuss it. How's that sound? Perfect. Can you, can you send a copy of that too, uh, Sarah? Yeah, I'm going to send it to everybody. It's just that it came over during the meeting, so yeah. I. I mean, at least he got back to us. <laughs> there are some people who don't respond to Peter. We have to right. take Mary. I agree. I mean, this has been a this has been a burr under my saddle for a while. So anyway, I'm I'm laughing with you, not at you. Believe me. <laughs> what else? What else have we got, Sarah? Next up is oh, I'm going to give you a brief update on 28 Ridge Road. You, that can wait. There's nothing. There's okay. nothing pressing about that. Okay. And then uh, correspondence. Uh, this is this has to do with I'm receiving not correspondence, the verbal complaints. I received two phone calls last week from somebody saying, I guess the Carol Picard's animals were kind of out of control last week, <laughs> and um, just wanting to know what the board was going to do about it. And I I read through our ordinance, and we have a dog running at large ordinance. We don't have a pig running at large, and I just don't know. Um, I don't know if there's, uh, I don't know if there's anything that you can do. Um, but so I'm just bringing, I just told them that I would bring it to the board and bringing it to the board. Well, I conducted a drive-by inspection of those premises the other day. And I did observe that she has built a bridge across the river, probably unpermitted and has created one or two pastures over on the other side of the river. So I don't know if that's where the animals are now. There's definitely some kind of a pen on the north end by her house that's got animals in it. Yes, Victor. Um, yes, so Jane and I went down and talked to her about the fence being fallen down into the road, the wooden one. Yeah. About the uh, about the uh, trash bin, and at that time she said she was moving them over on the other side. And I think, as you said, I was through there a couple of times and. Uh, just recently, and they have been moved, and even the trash bins been moved a little bit. I do think they're within the uh, 25 foot right away, but it's better, you know, progress, not perfection. Yeah, I'm out of here. Bye -bye. Even though the bridge is probably illegal. <laughs> Does she all? Hey, listen, if it solves, if it's if it solves or mitigates the problem, I'd say I'd say it's a, I'd say it's a good thing. So I feel badly, and I know Steve does. I feel badly for those animals. I'm not but, sure uh, that I'm not sure about the bridge, uh, Mary. I'm not sure. She the only thing she had to do, according to well before, I don't know if what was what's changed, but according to our uh, zoning regulations, she just has to meet with the uh, stream alteration guy, and he has to say yay or no. I mean, it's there's three of them down through there that are not really permitted anyway. Yeah. Well, does she own the land on the other side? Yes, Edgar Chapin's buried over there. Oh, okay. Hey, Sarah. Yeah. What's the deadline for if we're going to run for select board again? What's the deadline January for our signatures? 5 p.m. 5 p.m. when? January 15th. 15th. Okay. And then the other question, is, I, the other comment I want to make is I ha am acknowledging that you're requesting um, the little blurb for the, um, the town report, and I'm working on it. So I just don't want you to think I forgot. No, I'm sure you weren't. I give everybody long, long deadlines. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so January 15th or 15th for the for the petition is 15th for nominating. And how many signatures do we need? 30? 15. 15. And where do I get that form from mm -hmm. you? It's also on our website. You can. It's been there since August. Okay. Anybody <laughs> yes, Dorinda. Uh, the, the form says January 24th. 
Oh, let me just go check my thing. No, it doesn't. Well, I'm looking at it. Yeah. All right. Hey, Liz, well. is this your formal announcement for running? Nothing. Nothing. Well, I'm you know, gonna, I'm, I'm going to be there on whatever day it is at 4.59 p.m. <laughs> if I run one more time, Vic, it'll be 10 years. And then I think oh, it's she's right. it'll it be is time for me to retire. It's whatever it says on the form, January 24th. <laughs> or someone may run against me. Seriously, yeah, I have someone that I, I have someone who is actively wanting to talk with me about running for select board, and I think they want to run against me. Which is fine. I if I don't win, I don't win. And that means somebody else can someone enjoy. else can participate in these endless. Yes, someone else can have a grand old time. <laughs> what else, Sarah? Anything? Is that it? That's I it. Hope. Well, wait, okay. wait, Michael Levine wanted to, remember we had to amend the agenda to talk about the Middlesex Trails. Uh... So right. that was not warned. We should, we, he wanted to, he wanted to, uh, he talked to me. I told him to submit it to the select board. He just wanted the select board to say, yes, that sounds okay for their work program for the, uh, for the trails. And I don't think there's any urgency to that. I think we can read it over and uh, and approve it at our next meeting. Yeah, I, I read it. It's pretty uncontroversial. No, I think it's I think it's fine. But I but I think no, we should I think I we should formally approve it, and I think we should review it, and I think we should warn it. That's all I'm saying. So yeah, let's do it. No, I mean, I think he understood that too. Yeah. Yeah. Just, okay. to, just you just wanted to give the board a heads up. That's all. And that. Yeah. No. Okay, so we Merry are formally Christmas, adjourned. You want to yes, my my picture went away because I out of my battery is very very low. But Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Yeah, I want to go on the full. I want to know. I want to know when the Christmas party is, Liz. Are you? Didn't we designate you to throw the Christmas party this year? No, remember we're not allowed to because then we'd be. Oh, running. okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so this everyone have a safe Christmas and please. Please get your booster if you haven't done so already and stay safe and wear your mask whenever you can so that we all get through this Omicron healthy and not sick. Yes, absolutely. Merry Christmas, Merry everybody. Merry Christmas, everybody. See you next Bye -bye. year. Bye. Bye.